So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. We talk a lot about electricity, and electricity is powering our economy. It's powering our society. We're moving more and more towards electricity for motors, for transportation, for heating, then fossil fuels, and, I mean, going back to wood. So right now, if you kind of look around at your home or your business, the heating is in many cases all electricity. Um, Electricity for heat, for heat pumps, and obviously electricity for air conditioning. Our lights and our appliances, electricity, obviously. Entertainment systems, toys, computers, everything is running with electricity. And what's interesting is more and more of our transportation needs are being met by electric vehicles. And this trend is going to continue. The reasons are that it's more cost effective. Now, no doubt in the future that everything is going to be powered by electricity. It's no doubt in my mind. It's just cleaner and more efficient. But nevertheless, in the meantime, we've got a long-term transition. I mean, it's going to take 50 years because gasoline and natural gas are still inexpensive fuels. They're also really concentrated. I mean, you just think about it. A gallon of gas has as much energy as the battery packs in some electric vehicles. I mean, a gallon of gas will take you 30 miles, and my electric vehicle goes 30 miles or so on a gallon on a full charge. So very concentrated and still relatively inexpensive. But fossil fuels, gasoline, natural gas, they're major contributors to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a problem. But the real reason why we're, we're seeing that transition to electricity for transportation and everything else is electricity is turning out to be less expensive than these fossil fuels. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Now, so as a result, we're going to be relying more and more on on electricity. So the way we get this electricity is becoming increasingly important. So this year, I mean, we're, we're relying on electricity. This year, in my Silicon Valley home, I've experienced two long power outages. One went for about 12 hours, the other one went for almost four days. And that's not to mention a lot of shorter outages of a few minutes, you know, or 15 minutes or so. So it's problematic That in a society that's being powered more and more with electricity, that relies more and more on electricity, these power failures are, you know, crimping our lifestyle. They're actually bad. I mean, here in California, the problem of grid reliability is getting worse and worse and worse. I think back 20 years, we almost never even had, you know, a power outage for 15 minutes. Now we're having several a year, brief ones and long ones also. It used to be that if you had a car, it was a gas car, no power, okay, you can drive your car. But now if there's an EV, you can't get to work. Your heating system won't work without electricity. I mean, you can't even have a wood fire anymore. So you can't run that furnace. Hot water heaters, my hot water heater in my house, it's got electric ignition. There's no pilot light. So without electricity, the thing won't heat the water. The food in the fridge is going to go bad in 24 hours. No telephone service. Yeah, yeah, you still may have a cell phone, but the cell phone depends on talking to a modem or um, some infrastructure or an antenna somewhere on on a utility pole. And the utility pole doesn't have power. So your cell phone doesn't have anything to talk to. We don't have landlines anymore. And obviously no TV, video game, entertainment system. So, you know, yeah, for some people that cramps their lifestyle. But the, the impact on, on us at home was no hot water, no heat, no electricity for the refrigerators and the freezers. Yeah, we had flashlights, but it's a problem. So why is this happening? So there's two causes of these grid reliability problems. The first is kind of a, a national or a statewide problem when we talk about availability of power on the overall grid. And this is what I'm referring to is called the duck curve, the infamous duck curve. Now, imagine the profile of a duck from a side. It's got a high tail, it's got a low back, and then a very high neck that extends up. Now, if you look at that in the profile, that kind of illustrates the way that the energy is flowing through the state of California and, and other places, Germany, where in the middle of the day, We've got lots and lots of solar and wind power, and therefore the utility doesn't need to generate a lot of power. We have an excess of power in the middle of the day, but in the morning when you know there's not a lot of sun or wind, and especially in the afternoon and evening and night when we really need power, the 
the utility has to scrounge around and find more power because they're not getting power from solar and wind. So that neck of the duck becomes problematic where they have to really start cranking up natural gas generators and things like that to meet the load, or they start importing power from out of state or running the hydro. So that neck of the duck curve is where you have a steep increase in non-renewable, non-solar and wind power needs. And it's kind of a problem, but it's never really been a problem. It's never caused an outage because the utilities have been doing a good job to plan for that. They have adequate supplies of hydro, they have adequate power from out of state, um, and they're also able to use a lot of natural gas plants that step in when the sun and the wind kind of slow down in the afternoon and obviously at night. So we have a nice balanced system in the whole state where in the middle of the day, we use a lot of sun, we're not using a lot of natural gas, at night, crank up the natural gas, a a nice match. Now, it's going to evolve and change because eventually we're going to use more and more storage and wind at night, but for now, we're okay. So here's the good news. There's no documented reliability problems on the grid in California and most other places from the duck curve. It's handled. It's okay. It's working. But why are we having blackouts? The real problem is on local power delivery. The local power grid can't handle the demands of homes and businesses in these days. Why? Well, we have changes. Now, there's plenty of power in the state. We just can't get the power in the little wires to the homes, to the businesses. It doesn't matter that we have lots of wind, natural gas, storage. The homes and businesses can't get the power when they need it. So here's what happens to you. Here's what happened to me twice this year so far. And this was just a month ago, a hot a Sunday afternoon, Sunday weekend, right? It's in the middle of the day. We had plenty of solar. The temperature was really hot, about 100 degrees. It was hot earlier in the week too. At 1.30, the power just went out in my neighborhood, just power out. All right, you wait a few minutes, maybe it's going to come back. It didn't. 15 minutes later, you get worried, you look outside, and I just figured, hey, you know, this is really hot. A transformer in the neighborhood probably blew. The neighbors on one side were without power. The neighbors on the other side, they were still in the pool, and the pool thing was going, and they're listening to music. So it was just very, very localized. I figured, hey, there was a transformer issue. And those transformers are those can shaped things on the top of utility poles. And I confirmed this with PG&E that one of their transformers was overloaded, it blew out. Why did that happen? Well, it's interesting what's evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. A lot more people started putting in air conditioning, and and actually in our house, and we're putting in another air conditioning system. And and air conditioners use a lot of power at peak time. That people are using electric vehicles. You plug in an electric vehicle, boom, it pulls 30 amps for four hours. So there's a lot of power needs. And and by the way, they're they're putting in EVs because it's cost effective. They're putting in air conditioning because it's hotter than it used to be. It's not as comfortable. So somebody in the neighborhood... I don't know who, it wasn't us, but they probably plugged in their EV or somebody's air conditioning cranked on. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back, literally the extra load that overloaded that transformer and blew the thing out. So the transformer failed. The power was out to all the homes that were fed by that transformer, probably 20 or 30 homes. And and it took pg e about 12 hours to diagnose the problem. You know, obviously people are calling on their cell phone saying, hey, we've got power out. And then they kind of look at it and they say, oh, the transformer's out. So they had to go get a new transformer, put it in. It took took half a day. That's okay. They, they were pretty responsive. But I found out this problem happened in lots and lots of other places around California. It might have happened in your neighborhood sometime recently this year. And it's happening all over the country, especially where there's a lot of air conditioning load and new electric vehicles. The grid, the local grid wasn't designed for that. And it's not a weekday power issue. This happened on a weekend. So there's plenty of power, just that the power wasn't delivered to the neighborhoods that needed it. It wasn't delivered to the right place. Now, There's two solutions to this problem. One solution is the traditional solution, the business as usual solution, whereas the utility says, okay, we're going to upgrade the local grid. We're going to put in bigger transformers. We're going to put in thicker wiring that goes into the houses. We're going to put in more local control systems, and maybe we're going to put in some local battery storage. That's what the utility likes to do. And and that's that's a, a reasonable solution. It takes time and it's expensive, but that's what they like to do. That's their job. The other solution is for more homes and businesses to install their own rooftop solar system and to install their own battery storage system. That's a better solution for a number of reasons. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but it's cheaper and faster and more efficient. Okay. Now, let's talk a bit about solar for your home or your business. At Cinnamon Solar, we've been installing rooftop systems in the Silicon Valley for 17 years. We have thousands of happy customers. So check out our website or check out our five-star reviews on Yelp. 
And not only do we design and install systems, we've also been taking care of our solar customers for over 15 years. So if you have a solar power system and it needs maintenance, give us a call. And to make sure your job's done to our high quality standards, our installers are trained employees, not subcontractors. So if you're interested in a rooftop solar system or battery storage, come to our next free solar seminar on July 15th in Los Gatos. This is a free seminar, Saturday morning, July 15th. We'll talk about solar, battery storage. We'll have systems that are demonstrated. You can see how it's attached to the roof. You can see various battery storage systems. You can see the different kind of solar panels. You can talk to our sales staff and they can kind of help you understand how it's going to make sense for your home and and for your business. All right. And when we get back, we're going to talk about the cheapest and fastest ways to improve local grid reliability. So yeah, yes, the utility can do it. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of money, but there's a cheaper and faster way and homeowners and businesses will benefit directly. So that's what we'll do when we get back. Okay, so here we are. We're going to talk about the best ways to improve local grid reliability. So first, in terms of background, little known fact, public utilities get to earn a guaranteed rate of return on their total net assets. So this is kind of, you know, an accounting geeky thing, but it really explains why we have the grid we have and why we're having blackouts. So say a utility has, uh, I'm going to make up a number, $50 billion of assets. And these assets are power plants, substations, wires running to homes and businesses, transmission systems, their trucks, the transformers, the equipment, all that stuff. And, you know, that's about the size of, you know, a really, really big local utility. Now, they get to earn a 10% rate of return every year on these net assets. So their annual profits are guaranteed to be $5 billion as long as they have enough revenue to cover that. So they make their revenue by selling power to homes and businesses and they maximize it up to 10% of their net assets. So if they have you know too many sales, then actually it's going to get cut back, but they always get 10%. It's like a great deal. Always guaranteed 10%. That's a monopoly. And it's kind of the way they're set up. They're the only ones that can actually generate and sell power. They love it, but they hate it when there's competition. But so when you think about it from the utility standpoint, their motivation is to maximize their net assets because when, when their assets go up, they make more profit. So if they have $60 billion in assets, they can make $6 billion of profit. So they want to add more assets, more assets, more transformers, more trucks, more power plants, more money they make. So they want to upgrade the grid. They want to put in more power plants. They want to put in the battery systems because the more assets they have, the more profits they make. So when there are problems on the local grid... The utilities look at it from the perspective of, oh, we'll just upgrade the grid. Um, Customers will be happy because they'll have more reliable electricity and they'll make more profit. Now, there's another solution. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, when they upgrade the grid, they charge the customers more for electricity. Why do you think your electric rates keep going up and up and up? When I moved to California, electricity was like 15 cents. Now it's 25 cents and we're getting all this free solar power. So these grid upgrades... These increases in assets, they're not free. We pay for it in electric rates. So that's the business as usual case. Grid reliability, there's a problem. The utility is going to upgrade the grid. They're going to invest in more assets. They make more profits. The rates go up. They're happy. Customers are kind of like, you know, numb because what are they going to do about it? There wasn't anything they could do about it. But now there is something. So so from the utility's perspective, the last thing they want is for homeowners and businesses to put in rooftop solar and battery storage. Why? Because then they don't need to upgrade the grid. Then they don't get to sell more power. So these technologies are kind of at odds with what the utilities want to do. Now, the utilities also want to put in battery storage and solar, and they've done a ton of it, but that goes to their assets. And then they raise electric rates. It's much, much more expedient, cheaper for everybody if the homeowners and the businesses themselves do it. So the other solution... The better solution, the cheaper and faster solution to this local grid overload problem, because it's local. We're not talking about, you know, a problem in the middle of the desert somewhere. We're talking about a problem down your neighborhood street. We're talking about a problem outside of your office building where there's an overload on the transformer. The solution is for businesses and homeowners to put in solar and battery storage. Now, we call these technologies behind the meter solar and storage. It's behind the meter because it's on the customer's side of the meter. You've got that electric meter, the, the wires that go up to the utility pole, that's the utility side. From the electric meter, the wires that go into your building, your home, your office, that's on the customer side. So we want to put the, the 
battery storage and the solar on the customer side, behind the meter. Utilities sometimes can't see what's going on there. It just looks like you're using less power. It's like energy efficiency. So let's go back to the power outage that happened in my neighborhood in June. And this has happened a number of times to me before, at both in my office and my home. Now, why did this happen? Well, there's a transformer on a utility pole, and say this transformer had it was a 100-kilowatt transformer. It could manage 100,000 watts. It's about 400 amps. The overload that puts it over the top, maybe it was even going 110. 120, who knows? But it's it's just a little bit more power. Somebody plugs in an EV. Somebody's air conditioning kicks on. That overload just is the straw that breaks the camel's back. The thing basically just, poof, fried. Now, hypothetically, let's say that just one more house in the neighborhood had a six kilowatt solar system. That transformer would not have been overloaded. The solar would have been cranking out at 1.30 in the afternoon, plenty of power, maybe 5,000 watts on a hot day. You wouldn't have had that overload. Or if one more house had a battery storage system, when the grid gets this kind of close to an overload, the home's power could have been supplied by the batteries. The transformer wouldn't have been overloaded. So when businesses and homeowners install solar and storage, it solves the problem locally. But also, and this is really important, the businesses and homeowners pay for these investments themselves. They're not charging the utility for it. They're not charging other ratepayers for it. They're saying, hey, I want to put in a $15,000 solar system. I'm going to save money on electricity. Or I'm going to put in a battery storage system so I got power at night. So the utility doesn't have to charge ratepayers more. Rates don't go up for everyone else. So behind the meter storage and solar is better for everyone from an economic standpoint, everyone except for the utility, because everyone doesn't pay. And it's also better from a deployment standpoint because this could be done pretty quickly. 25% of the homes in my neighborhood could have solar installed in three months. Boom. That whole grid reliability problem, completely gone. Now, everybody would love it. You know, there's financing for it. It's not an economic thing. The only people that wouldn't like it was is the utility, and they're trying to push back on it. But that's the best, fastest, cheapest solution to this overload problem. Now, kind of look at it from an overall standpoint. California's got more solar than the rest of the country combined. We have 10,000 megawatts, 10 gigawatts of utility solar, which the utilities buy for like four cents a kilowatt hour. It's the same as cheap natural gas. We've got five gigawatts, 5,000 megawatts of rooftop solar, homes and businesses. And when homes and businesses put these systems in, it costs five to eight cents a kilowatt hour. <laughs> Economically, you know, I kind of look at that. This is what, you know, our customers are like, hey, I can get solar for six cents a kilowatt hour. They're paying 25. That's why the economics are so strong. So California's moving towards 100% renewables. It's a big goal. It's a stretch goal. Candidly, we're not sure how we're going to get there. But economically, no doubt in my mind that we can get there in 20 or 30 years. You know, there's lots of articles about why we can and why we can't. Kind of my perspective, and I, I kind of like what Yogi Berra said, it's very hard hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So thanks, Yogi. My view is that we'll get to 50% renewables, and then we'll learn, and then we'll get to 80, and then we'll learn, and then we'll get to 100, and the way we get to 100 is we're improving on 80. So we'll have, in the meantime, plenty of natural gas turbines, but we're not going to have any nuclear and coal, but this transition is going to happen faster than what everybody expects. Now, when we start to talk about overall grid reliability... The state has a really good supply of electricity now. We've got a lot of sources of electricity. We have hydro again. The dams are full of water. We've got lots and lots of solar plants in the desert. We've got wind turbines all over the state. And we have plenty of natural gas turbines. We have a pretty good transmission grid in the state where we can move power around. So this is all very good. We have plenty of power, like plenty of highways. But And the other thing is, and people criticize, and God, the Secretary of Energy Perry is saying solar and wind are making the grid less reliable. Absolutely wrong, Mr. Perry. Categorically wrong. The issue is we're using more local electricity. That's where reliability problems are. We're not having a statewide outage. It's a local outage. So these local grids are less reliable than ever before, and battery storage is a terrific way to solve that problem quickly, as as is rooftop solar. Now, the problem about battery storage is that it's still kind of expensive. Now, the costs are coming down really fast with volume, and it's mostly driven by the popularity of electric vehicles because we're using lots and lots of batteries in electric vehicles. The more batteries we manufacture, the more the costs come down. Just like what happened in solar when solar started, it was really expensive, $50,000 for a system at home. Now it's ten to 15000 Why? Because there's so much volume. So, you know, from a battery storage standpoint, we probably have fewer than 1,000 battery storage systems connected to the home grid in the whole whole state. That's going to change pretty dramatically. So the jumpstart, to make that change faster, to jumpstart that battery storage market 
and also to improve local grid reliability, California has proposed something called SB 700. It's called the Energy Storage Initiative. Now, this bill mimics the California Solar Initiative, and it does it in a way that supports homeowner and business-owned energy storage systems with incentives that ramp down as costs decline. So, When this bill kicks in, hopefully in 2018, there's going to be big incentives because batteries are still going to be kind of expensive. But as the years go by, 2019, 2020, 2021, the incentives are going to go down as the cost of batteries go down. And, you know, we're going to get to a point, I don't know, five years, 10 years from now, where battery storage probably isn't even going to need to be incentivized. So here's my wrap up conclusion. The local power outages are getting more common. It's not because of wind and solar. It's not because of renewables. It's because it's of an overloaded local electric grid. Now, we can pay the utility to upgrade this local electric grid. It's going to cost tons of money, and we're going to be paying higher electric rates forever. Or we can encourage customers, homeowners, businesses to install their own solar and storage systems. Solar's cheap. Storage is going to be cheap, and we're going to use something like SB700, that energy storage initiative, to reduce the cost. And the result is going to be a cheaper grid and a more reliable grid. All right, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show, and thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. If you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at cinnamonsolar.com and listen to the podcast. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Barry. 